Good morning and welcome. Mitigating Against Education Disadvantage, Leave No One Behind is a collaborative event with our Learning City partners to explore and identify commitments, allowing each of us as educational stakeholders to pledge sustainable and consistent levels of support and good practice for all our learners. And to do so in a manner which further builds upon existing good practice in delivering education and training in our communities. Today's webinar sets out to achieve two goals. The first is to further advance an education dialogue we have shared and developed for many years. Now, this will happen through a series of discussions, presentations and responses, with contributors sharing their experiences and practices at international, national and equally importantly, local levels. This second goal is long term and is to sustainably build upon the work of today to address key issues such as access and educational opportunity for all learners across this region. Now, to assist us in this goal, we will establish in January 2021 a group made up of representatives from all key education stakeholders in the region. This will meet under the chairpersonship of Dr. Barry O'Connor, President of CIT, and of course, with your participation, your experience, and with all of us working collectively, we can together map out how we may strategically support every learner on their personal pathway to engage positively and effectively at every point along their lifelong learning journey. To commence proceedings, I would like to thank our president, Michael D. Higgins, for his very thoughtful and considered personal message wishing us well and through his message offering his guidance to us today. In his message, President Higgins remind us in this commemorative centenary year, if we are to live up to the aspiration of the founders of our independence to cherish all of the children of the nation equally, we must ensure that none of our citizens are denied the education that is the key to their empowerment, their flourishing, and their ability to participate fully in society. Now, 100 years later, he emphasizes that we must acknowledge that there still exists entire sections of our society for whom such access remains very difficult or even impossible. And in guiding us today in achieving our goals, he says, let us also not forget that the benefits of education are not just provided with benefits at an individual level. The values which are instilled in students in our education system are carried forward into society through their role in their communities, their ability to use their voice proactively and the way in which they harness and offer their gifts, talents, intelligence and wisdom for the benefit of others. The President concludes by thanking all involved at each side of the screen today and commends each and every one for their commitment to helping those who are vulnerable and marginalised to transform their lives through the empowering tool of education. Thank you, President Higgins. I would also like to thank all those for who will be contributing to today's event and who you will see on screen over the next while. And a special thanks to all those who you will not see would have worked so hard behind the scenes these past few weeks to make today's event happen. I now invite Dr. Barry O'Connor, President of CIT, to introduce our panel and to chair our first session. And in doing so, I also ask and encourage each of you to share your comments and thoughts today on social media by using the hashtag Access for All. Fight for all clear stock, could you seminar talk with show? You're all very welcome to this very important and exciting webinar. Simple title, leaving no one behind. And it's great that we have such a, a, a strong panel of providers, of learners, and of institutional uh, supports for education assembled today to, to lay out the platform for that very simple objective of leaving nobody behind in education, a pathway for every learner as the CETB uh, have it as their objective here in Cork. 
Uh, we are lucky to be joined this morning by the Chief Executive of the of Solace, uh, Andrew Brownlee. Uh, nearly made a mistake there because Andrew was also in IOTI and he was in HEA. So Andrew is a, a man of many pasts in terms <laughs> of uh, education provision. Um, next to, to Andrew, we've got Adrian Rogers, who is the Director of Services with Cork City Council. Again, a very strong partner in education delivery and access to education here in Cork. Uh, then we've got Dennis Leamy, who is the Chief Executive of Cork ETB, who are, are I guess, the, 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 one of the chief providers of real access to education here in Cork, as the ETBs are, are generally, uh, across the continuum of further education, but also branching into higher education. And finally, we've got Paula Cogan, President of Cork Chamber, uh, who again is a great advocate of, of education and you know we may be talking later on about education in the workplace and there are some of the strong pathways we have. So maybe to begin, maybe I could refer to, to QQI which is the, the statutory authority guaranteeing the quality of awards and standards uh, across the country and they have three words in their, in their as part of their, their, their sectoral conventions as access, transfer and progression and I think that's what we're talking about today access to education, transferring between educational um, uh, systems and progression from one to the next. So maybe it might begin and get, get a, a commentary for, from Andrew in terms of the, the overall sort of um, perspective on those very simple words, leaving no one behind in education. Andrew. Uh, thanks very much, and I, and I suppose just to say, first of all, um, it's a real privilege to, to, to be here, and it's great to see you all come together in, in part to kind of shine a light on such an important issue like um, leaving no one behind and mitigating against educational disadvantage. Um, I suppose um, just to, to give you a little bit of um, insight into what SOLAS does, so we are the state agency responsible for further education and training and also for apprenticeships in, in Ireland. And I suppose when SOLAS and the ETBs were, were first created in 2013, and we struggled a little bit with the identity of further education and training, or, or FET as we, we kind of call it for short. Um, I think we, we, we had a look and, and um, there were just so many different programmes, so many different types of facilities. There wasn't really much integration between the further education side, which had previously been run by vocational ed educational committees, the, the VECs, and the training side, which would previously be run, been run on a, a national level by cost. Um, so when, when we had kind of discussions around how you can move the concept of further education and training forward, um, People kind of dismissed the possibility that that FET could ever be a kind of a single entity, a, a single thing, and there was a lot of commentary at the time around you know FET being defined by by what it's not. Um, there was also a kind of strong sense that we we did a kind of lump of stuff that was really about inclusion and about tackling disadvantage, and then we did another lump of stuff which was um, you know more about developing vocational skills that will either take you into uh, a job or, or go into higher education. Um, and actually, funnily enough, um, the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform did a, a spending review kind of three or four years ago. And they actually reinforced that they can almost split further education and training up in two into that kind of, well, this is to kind of help with social inclusion and this is to give people the, the skills that they need to progress and, 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 and for work. I suppose that's something I've always kind of fundamentally disagreed with. Um, because I, I think what makes FET truly unique is that FET is for absolutely everyone. Um, FET is available in every community in Ireland. It doesn't matter what your background is or, or what your level of formal education is. FET can offer you a pathway to take you as far as we want to go. And look, I think there's a real opportunity to start to really push that idea and the, the development of a, of a new strategy. Um, and we launched our, our new strategy this summer when we got the, the, a, a new department and, and a new minister, um, Minister Simon Harris. Um, we called our new strategy Transforming Learning because that's fundamentally um, what it's all about. It was built up around three interlinked pillars on building skills, on facilitating um, pathways, and fostering 
and collision. Um, and there's a tendency to come to an event today and really only focus on the, the inclusion part. But for me, that that's not how we mitigate an, an educational disadvantage. Um, it might be the start of the journey, but unless we can link, you know, that, that kind of access and inclusion piece pathways through further education and training and into higher education, unless you can offer a route out of the disadvantage that will actually equip you with the skills to sustain jobs, sustain a job and sustain a career, then you're not really addressing the issue at all. So I think, you know, in the new strategy, we've identified a whole range of things that we plan to do in, in, in partnership with the, with the ETBs. I think that the first thing is, is around, you know, developing a, a much more cohesive approach to community-based education and how we work with our community education partners to deliver real on-the-ground responses. But not only that, to, to link the very good work that's done on the, the ground in communities a much longer term pathway through it, through all of the NFQ levels that the ETBs offer and potentially beyond into higher education. That's the little piece of the jigsaw that I think has been missing to some extent in the past in, in the past. We do an awful lot of work, you know, at level one, level two, level three, giving people literacy and numeracy support, running community education courses. But for me there maybe hasn't been quite enough focus. And then showing these, these learners that there's a learning pathway all the way through that can take them as far as they want to go. And we really need to focus on that. We also need to focus on, on a much more consistent system of, of learner support, of learner guidance. I think that has to take into the, in, in, in the idea of, of the kind of financial support that we offer learners as well. It needs to be much more available to, for part-time learning and, and part-time provision. I think we need to get away from the, the, the kind of welfare versus Susie device. Because at the moment, if you do a level five traineeship in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ATB, you have to, you know, kind of sign on and, you know, um, get, receive unemployment benefit to, to get your training allowance. If you want to do a level five in a college of further education, you have access to a Susie grant. And obviously, if you want to do higher education, again, access to a Susie grant. But that type of stuff just reinforces the inequality and, and the disadvantage that we see across communities. I think we need to move to a much more universal system of, of financial support. We obviously need to target key cohorts to facilitate access. Um, and I think that's really important that we, we think about how we can engage different groups of, of kind of disadvantaged learners. Um, but I also think a tool in targeting disadvantage will also lie in, in you know, breaking down our educational offering. And I think that's something that extends across both BET and across uh, higher education. We need to provide access to learning in a much more modular, a much more bite-sized way so that everyone um, can dip in and dip out of education throughout lifetimes and careers. I think, you know, we all recognise that's absolutely set essential for the, the future world that, that we, we live in. I think, you know, it also gives us an opportunity to make education more accessible for those daunted by the formality and, and, and the length of, of the current courses. So I think that's really important to think about moving forward. And that has to link to, to a really strong focus on debt creation pathways, pathways that we offer from our further education and training courses into technological universities, into institutes of technology, and into, into universities um, and beyond. Um, we already know that 20% of the, the kind of technological higher education sector, 20% um, um, of their intake comes from further education and training. We also know that a background is uh, equipped to, to, to get through their degree. You know, it gives them the, the kind of foundational skills that will help them better to deal with that kind of higher education experience. Um, there's research that shows if you've got a background, there's a 75% chance of you doing um, of completing your degree. And, you know, while there's no kind of like for like comparison, if you go straight into higher education with say less than 300 points in your leaving cert, you know the chances are 50 50 that you'll get through to the end. And um, there's also really good links already at a local level between PET and HE. Um, you know, universities, technological universities, IOTs, ETBs, and their colleges 
working together and, and look, I think part's the case in point in that you always have really strong links and you have a real clear sense of what the role of each of your your kind of um, educational providers is in, in, in that context. But I do think we, we have a problem in that there's no universal um, approach across Ireland and there's no universal recognition of tech qualifications across the board. And that makes for a confusing landscape when we're trying to persuade people to that there is a whole pathway um, through the system. You know, even the way that we treat advanced entry um, 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 eligibility, I think, varies significantly from, from institution to, to institution. So what we need in future is, is a real consistent, understandable system where anyone, you know, regardless of where they are, regardless of their background, regardless of their formal education, regardless of the community that, that they live in, can actually see a clear pathway if they want it, you know, when you're at school or at the first point when you enter further education and training or at any point throughout your lifetime and career. And that's the real vision that we're trying to, to work towards in partnership with both further education and training, partnership with ETBs, and partnership with higher education, partnership with industry, and partnership with our communities across Ireland. So thank you. Thank you for that, Andrew. And you've raised a few questions. You've identified a few issues here that we might look at later on. But I guess one of the, the main drivers here in Cork, one of the unique features in Cork, and we have many unique features in Cork, put that on the record, but one of the unique features we have here in Cork is, is the role of the City Council in actually developing and, and putting the structure in place and for, for delivery of education for those pathways. And maybe Adrian might come to yourself next and sort of outline the, the vision that City Council have and the work you've been doing in terms of providing these pathways. And because when we had the, the UNESCO City of Learning Conference uh, 2017 now, and one of the unique features that the UNESCO people found was the role of City Council. So maybe, Adrian, hand over to yourself to, see, to get the City Council's perspective. Thanks, Barry. And uh, that was really interesting, Andrew. So thanks for that insight. Um, I suppose just with regards to Cork City Council as the local authority, we have um, shown a commitment to the principles um, of, you know, the city learning cities and lifelong learning. Um, we have woven all of those principles through our corporate plans our economic and community plans at local level and I suppose our real commitment was shown um, over eight or nine years ago when we actually established a dedicated unit within Cork City Council to actually address um, the Learning Cities initiative and I suppose from that as you mentioned Barry grew that UNESCO um, conference that we held in Cork in 2017 which was hugely successful. I suppose one thing that I would like to point out is that that unit is actually placed within a directorate in Cork City Council, which touches directly on community and social inclusion. Uh, it, we have um, development management where we inform good placemaking. And of course, we also have our library structure. And it's no accident that the lifelong learning and the learning cities is actually based in this directorate so that we're all working together with communities on the ground. And there's a lot of outreach, I suppose, from the local authority. So we have a really good social infrastructure within Cork City Council, but I think the real magic happens when we actually move outside our own area in the local authority and we join up with all of the partners across Cork. And it's working with UCC, the Munster Technological University, Cork ETB, Chamber of Commerce, and all of the other organizations that work together um, you know, to encourage and enhance the offering that we have for people. Um, who are trying to access education at all levels. Um, I suppose in a previous life, I would have been involved a lot with business and I would have been involved in a lot of development work with businesses. So learning isn't just about the individual and it's not just about the higher education either. There's a lot of de de developmental pieces, I think, that we can actually work and, and work cohesively together, you know, and, and share those experiences across the different sectors. So um, I suppose really um, we're, we're delighted to be part of a programme that actually provides more access to all. Um, it's what we want to see happen. And um, I think that's about as much as I have to say on that at the moment, Barry. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Adrian. And I guess the, the ETB, Cork ETB, is sort of uniquely positioned, really, in terms of with delivering education right there through from primary, secondary, further education, 
links into higher education as well and community education. So, so maybe Dennis, uh, Dennis Leamy, CEO of Cork ETB, Dennis, you might outline the, 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 the key features of your strategy of leaving no one behind and the pathway for every learner. Dennis. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, Barry. And uh, I, I think um, Andrew has set a very good, good, good context in terms of some of the things we're going to talk about. And then I suppose Adrian has reflected the, the strong local uh, relationships that that is is critical to to deliver on our, our <coughs> mission. So in Cork ETB, we we support over forty one thousand learners, as as Barry was saying, from from actually early years. We have we've, we're involved in a number of early years creches as well as the the peace of nations of schools and the further and, and higher uh, further education and the and the and the training. So I suppose we we go across the the breadth of it, and and as, and part of the the the. Uh, initiative of today in terms of leaving no, no one behind, I suppose we're thinking about it in the context of the sustainable development goal number four, which is edu education for all. It's talking about uh, promoting promotion of lifelong lifelong learning. Uh, and when I was thinking about the, that, that, that goal, I, I reflect over the last nine months in terms of uh, COVID, uh, it's, been, it's been a struggle, especially at the start, to ensure that we're in a position to provide uh, that service and that support to all learners across the various, the various strands. And I think a lot of people, especially within the, the schools and the further education sector, have done Trojan work to ensure that those supports were there, that, we've, we, that we're able to offer a quality uh, edu education and a quality training to all, the, all, the, all, the, all our learners across the, the, those various, various pieces. But I think there's something we need to reflect on as well in that. Um, so if I think of the school side, um, that, that, you know, uh, we've, well, we've all the students and the learners there, there is there is an, an impact on teaching and learning because of the, the 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 health and safety piece that's in place, and it's something that we're going to have to be conscious of, especially in terms of students and learners that find it difficult or that need additional supports. And it's something that we need to be mindful of when we move out of this period. And the same with the further education and training. Just in terms of I was met, we met with the the principals of the further education colleges there a couple of days ago, and that was our conversation. It was around the vulnerable learners, the the learners that need those additional supports, and all our colleges and our training institutions are doing their very best to ensure that the trainings, the supports are there, the one-to-one -one engagement, ensuring that, pe that, that no one is getting left, left behind in terms of their, their studies, but there's an increased focus on it. And what enables that is that we, that, that it is born out of that, the way we, we do our business, it's born out of the care for all the, the learners that we have across, across the system. But there's a, there is a challenge for us, I think, over the next while to ensure that we're focused on that. And indeed, uh, the, the fund that Minister Harris announced in terms of mitigating against the education disadvantage and that SODUS uh, have, have managed uh, on, on behalf of the, de of the department has been a great boon to that in that, uh, in, in, for example, in Cork, we've, we've just managed to get under a million euro to support access for all those all the vulnerable learners, especially within the community education sector uh, over the next uh, number, number of months. And that's a real, real support. But it's critical that we continue it. That is not a one-off. That we say that we're able to sustain that through the next period period of period of time, and the other piece in terms of that sustainable development goal that I think about is around the um, increasing the number of people with relevant skills for their own financial success, and I think that really talks to the links with you know business employers, links links with quality jobs. Uh, it's you know we're we're we're, we're trying to mm. we're look at the lifelong learning phase. It's not just about young people; it's about people right across the spectrum. Where they're, where they're at in terms of their career, where they're at in terms of their job, maybe they're, maybe they're out of work or maybe someone's coming through the COVID, uh, on the COVID payment at the moment. So how do we meet them in terms of where they're at at the moment? And it's up to us in the, in the training institutions and in the education institutions to provide that support uh, to them where, where they're at so that, it, so that we're improving their financial viability as individuals, as families, as part of a, an, overall, an overall community. And one of the programs that we're involved in with, with, with SOLUS, of course, is the skills to compete uh, a program which is looking at the skills that people have from their prior learning or experience but how we might build on that and it's focusing on short-term courses that helps them to move into another sector we know the sectors that have been affected and i'm sure paul is going to talk about that uh for, through this uh, COVID piece and it's about how we need to how we have to adapt and i think through the framework that SODUS has, has put out through the strategy and that we're implementing at a local level to the etbs and the higher ed education sector we're ensuring that we're adaptable and that we can evolve and respond to the situation as it's, as it's arising. So, and, and what all of that is built on as well is that framework and the foundation of the connection with all our partners. And the last thing I'll say, Barry, is that uh, yesterday we had our community forum meeting, which is led by Anne Doherty in, in City, City Council. 
bringing all the community education partners together. And it's, it's a, I have to say, it's, it's really a fantastic and motivating forum to be part of mm -hmm. because it's about taking care of people in terms of uh, food poverty and, and looking at people in terms of loneliness, ensuring that people are, are met in terms of educa 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 education and other needs that people have. And it's, that, that forum has operated from the first week in March of when this pandemic started and has operated on a weekly, monthly basis in terms of all the neighborhood networks but that didn't happen by accident. That had to be based on a foundation and a history and a capacity that was built over years in Cork. Uh, and of course, we're always going to claim that we're uh, better than everyone, everyone else. But the, it, it, these things build over time so that when, when, when things do happen, like the pandemic, or other, other things uh, evolved, that all our institutions, all our businesses, all our communities are in a place to respond as effectively as possible. So I'll leave it there, Barry. Thanks very much, Dennis. And, you know, I, I suppose turning to, to, to Paula as President of the Cork Chamber, uh, I suppose the lifeblood of industry and commerce does depend on professionals and skilled people coming in, in into the system. And, you know, we've had, say, in CIT, soon to be MTU, we've had some great uh, cooperation with uh, members of Cork Chamber in terms of joint mentorship programmes and so on, and also through, say, STEM Southwest. So, the importance of, of, of education and the importance of pathways, I guess, Paula, for people in work, in the professions, in the various skills. How, how, do you, how, do you, how does the Chamber view that? I suppose, um, Barry, it's, it's great to have the opportunity to talk today. We, um, from a Cork Chamber perspective, we represent over 1,200 companies in the Cork region um, with over 100,000 employees. Again, as everybody's alluded to, um, Cork, I suppose, size-wise, um, just makes it really, really easy for both industry and education to work together. And that's been a linchpin of Cork in the last 40 to 50 years. We've noticed completely as a result of COVID that that has actually been accelerated. So for instance, Dennis, Barry and I sit on the Cork Development Forum um, and um, from the outset of COVID, our meetings were brought to every two weeks. So we were really aligning our policies and procedures together from an education and industry perspective to ensure we we're fit for purpose. To be able to go out um, to our membership um, and those companies include US multinationals, um, small to medium enterprises, entrepreneurs, and be able to say that Cork has over 50,000 students in further education. It's phenomenal. It's um, from a chamber perspective, we do a, a barometer and a survey with our membership every year. And number one and number two consistently for the last five years has been talent attraction. So that's a unique selling point when we go out from a Cork perspective to win those businesses. And we all know in the, in the middle of a pandemic, if you look at the fantastic announcements that have been made in the Cork region, just in the last six weeks alone of companies coming in and, and that talent attraction has stood to us in, in the middle of a pandemic. So it's incredibly important that relationship piece between the, the local authorities, uh, the universities, the further education groupings um, and industry <coughs> is absolutely crucial. As we all know, for instance, um, I would just take an example of one of our members, um, Bob Savage, who is the vice president of Dell here in Cork. So this week, um, it was fantastic to be able to acknowledge Bob and present him with the Outstanding Contribution to Business Award from Cork Chamber. But we also know that Bob sits as um, a chair of both the um, Cork Institute of Technology as it was, and also in the Skills Network Forum. So again, that just shows an, um, an organization, a company that's here in Cork, who's giving back in so many ways, but also understands the value of education. So what has happened there basically is, uh, as I know, is that Dell and many other of our other companies have worked with um, CIT, with UCC, and with the other institutes to make sure that we are bringing through uh, people of the future who are fit for industry. Um, and that just doesn't, that doesn't happen organically, that has to be planned. And again, it's down to individuals and companies um, and the institutes working together. That's, that's fantastic for Cork. So that's just one element of what I feel is, is very important from an education perspective. But as also mentioned, you know, with 100,000 employees in Cork, our membership are also looking at their own continuous professional development, the opportunities that exist nowadays. As we all know, our workforce has changed phenomenally. Our millennials, you know, I suppose when we started out on our, our own career paths, it was you were lucky to get a job and you yeah. stayed in that <laughs> job forever. Um, the majority of our, our new um, people coming into industry and into careers will have four or five different roles, four or five different jobs ahead of them, which is very exciting. But that also offers an opportunity for a continuous 
professional development and they want that they're eager to learn throughout their own careers as well so that's incredibly important to to our membership as well it's also very commercially viable as you can imagine if you are promoting from within developing people from within your own organization it's a lot cheaper than having to go out and actually to to win new employees effectively as well so that's incredibly important we also know that many of our organizations and again i suppose i reflect back on for instance an organization like dell who are giving back to the community through um, education and further education, you know, running courses from a transition year perspective, running courses with um, older members of the community, bring them in, learning about technology, how to use it, etc. as well. So it's it's an element, not just of education, but actually of giving back and being good citizens mm -hmm. in a region as well. And that's incredibly important too. I suppose from my own perspective, um, I have always been involved and uh, Dennis Barrett will know um, in my previous industry from a hospitality perspective in the Cork Lifelong Learning Festival. And again, to see the opportunities are there in Cork, um, as has been alluded to already, to learn at so many different levels from beekeeping right the way through to, you know, PhDs, etc. And that's in, that's in our in our citizens um, and it's a part of our DNA in Cork as well, that, that element of curiosity. Uh, and of wanting to learn as well. Um, we recently had an event with Martin Shanahan, who's head of the IDA. And again, he just so mentioned how from uh, an IDA perspective to go out internationally and speak to that talent that exists in Cork is why we are actually winning all of the, the, the great announcements that we've seen in, in the last few weeks. I suppose again, it's uh, as as Dennis had mentioned. You know, COVID has left somebody, some people behind at the moment. Um, um, I have recently moved from 25 years in a career in the hospitality industry. Many of my colleagues are out of work and will continue to probably be out of work right the way through into 2021. So again, it's an opportunity there for people to upskill, to move into different industries, but there will be an education requirement for that and supports to ensure that that can happen in an effective manner. Um, I myself have always valued um, education. I suppose I was very, very fortunate to get to do a Cornell course four or five years ago. And actually it was a pivotal moment um, for me because it allowed me to look at my own career and decide to make some changes as well. So I think that, again, it's not just about the younger people. I think, you know, us oldies can also consider uh, continuous professional development um, and the opportunities that might be out there as well um, in industry. But again, I think the link that we've all spoken to today is just about that, that you know, quirk working together, industry, being a partner with education. And that's what our success has been. And that will, will be what our success will be in the future. I would also say COVID has actually provided a huge opportunity for learning to go online. From an online learning perspective, who knew that we could offer so many courses um, and so many opportunities to learn again in a module form format online. And that's going to be part of, I would say, education for the future. Um, and you know, incredibly important to how we move forward in Cork from an education perspective as well. Okay, thank you very much, Paula. And maybe just, just briefly to, 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 to wind up this session, if we go back to the national perspective again, to yourself, Andrew, how do you see the, the, the formation of the new government department combining research, further higher education? What, what major new strategy will we see coming out from the department um, in, in terms of pathways to learning for, for every, everybody? Um, yeah, but look, I, I actually think, or what I hope, I suppose, and, and the early signs are, are really positive, I think, is exactly the stuff the four of us have talked about, you know, that merging of the need to really drive economic development with, with a kind of um, priority around in social cohesion, you know, and linking all of that with what communities need, with, with what um, enterprise needs at a, at a regional level. You know, I, I think they're the real key signals that are coming out of the, the department and actually look I, I personally believe it's, it's a real positive development as as yourself and, and, and Dennis will know because we were part of a, a much wider department of education while it had some advantages in terms of that continuum of, of education you know we you know the post second level always got a little bit lost you know whether it was talking about industrial relations talking about funding talking about you know more flexibility more agility which we're going to need to, to meet all of the needs for kind of and you stop selling and, and lifelong learning moving forward so i think by giving our system our collective system a real focus 
a real drive around those kind of dual economic and social objectives. But I, I think the future is really bright, and, and we're already seeing signs of this. And I think as we hopefully move out of this, this COVID kind of um, restricted period, the legacy of that in terms of online um, provision, in terms of increased flexibility, in terms of having a much clearer sense of, of how we need to change to meet the future world of work, um, I think that can only be a benefit to us, to us all. Right. Thank you very much, Andrew. Maybe the, the final word in this session to, to, to Dennis in terms of this particular initiative, Mitigate Against Educational Disadvantage, Pathway for Every Learner. What, what, what do you see as going forward into 2021, Dennis? Well, going forward into 2021, Barry, I, I hope that we continue to build on the relationships and partnerships that we, that we have uh, in, in, in relation to building the different different pathways, the different different connections that that that, that we ha that we have, and we ha and we have a structure that I, I spoke about earlier earlier on in the, in the introduction about uh, the steering group, which you thankfully are going to chair uh, for us in in the new new year, made up of the different stakeholders, and we'll be looking, I suppose, what what the needs are. Taking up taking up pause, by you know that things have things have changed now. We're looking at uh, what the needs will be coming out of coming out of COVID. Responding to us, things that are happening at a regional at a regional level, so we're able to, able to develop things further. If I could take up the piece about the world of work, I remember reading an OECD report in 20, 2018, something about the world of work, saying that 40 percent of jobs were going to change within 10 years or 15 years. Well, COVID has uh, has uh, has thrown that out the window because I think all jobs have changed now in the in the in, the, in the, during this during this time, and it's how we respond flexibly and evolve to that, and how we ensure that that we connect communities. We connect mm -hmm. business, we connect uh, in the, the different institutions in the city and the county to respond to that as effectively as, as possible. And that we're meeting the, I mean, we talk about digital literacy as well, which is, which is key and critical. We always assume that you know, the young people are the ones uh, in, in, engaged with it. But actually, there's, there's a good percentage of those young people that are not. They, they might have use of it in terms of social media, but in terms of learning, there's a lot that, that, need, that we need to do to support, support them. So there's a whole range of supports that we need to work on and build and grow. But, but what's really great, and we've, you've heard it here this morning, is that we have a very sound base to work off. Thank you very much, Dennis. And I, I began by talking about QQI in their sectoral conventions and so on. And one of the issues of QQI always has to be uh, is the provision of public information so that the public know what's happening on various educational programs and can have confidence in the standards and so on. And I think the, the contribution of Egypt on behalf of City Council, Dennis, the ET, CETB, and Paul with the, the whole the industry connection, and Andrew Brownlee, and in, in sort of from a national perspective, I think we've, you know, the, this is a great step towards that provision of public information because I think as Andrew was saying, it's a two-way street. We can put on programs we can put on short programs, long programs, four-year long programs, but we also need the the people in industry, people in schools, you know, actual learners. It must be a learner-centric operation. But if they don't know what's, what's available, then they, they, they can't, that, that's the first problem with access. So thank you to everybody this morning for, for your contributions. Thanks, I was Thanks. Our next panel is International Perspectives on Mitigating Against Educational Disadvantage, where we welcome the input from both the OECD and UNESCO. The panel bring a wealth of international and national experience and I would like to thank them for their participation. I would also like to thank Professor John O'Halloran, Interim President of UCC, for chairing this session. So I'd like to welcome you to panel two of our, our international perspectives and key learnings to create equal opportunities for all. Um, uh, earlier this week uh, in, in Dingle, uh, as part of the Other Voices and as also a part of Ireland's Edge, I shared a panel myself with a number of colleagues looking at equal access for all across education, particularly during the COVID period. And I think, you know, we, whatever happens in the world with pre-COVID, certainly the world is very different post-COVID. And I'm really pleased to have a number of international perspectives here this morning uh, to share their views. And then we'll have a conversation with the view to trying to learn what we can do better as a community, as an educational community, to enable the best opportunities for all. And I'm really pleased that the, our first speaker is Jonathan Barrow, who's head of unit at OECD. Uh, Jonathan is Head of the Employment and Skills Unit within the Local Employment Skills and Social Innovation Division of the Centre for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. Uh, we're really intrigued to hear Jonathan's story, uh, but he's going to 
I uh, talked to us about the role of court, John's role in where he coordinates the OECD Forum for Local Development Practitioners, Entrepreneurs and Social Innovators, the OECD Reviews on Local Job Creation and the OECD's Employment and Skills Strategies initiative in, in, across the world, but in particular in Southeast Asia. John, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. I'm looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say and then we'll open up further after my other colleagues have spoken. So thank you, Jonathan, and over to you. Great, thanks a lot, John. So uh, just to introduce myself, I work, uh, as John mentioned, in what's called the OECD Center for Entrepreneurship, SMEs, Regions and Cities. And essentially, we're a, we're a shop within the OECD that really looks at the, the importance of place-based policies. So when we're examining any labor market or employment or skills trend or policy response, really looking at the role of the subnational level in, in the importance of catering policies to different needs across countries that we know differ. So when we think, uh, we think about COVID, COVID is really, um, to nobody's surprise, been a huge shock to our economy economies and no community has been spared. We look at GDP as pummeled, plummeted, sorry, the number of hours work has drastically shrunk and unemployment is spiking. If we look at the current OECD unemployment rate, it's sitting at about 7.1% as of October 2020. Ireland, in comparison, it's sitting at about 7.3% as of October. Um, but we saw during the first uh, phase of the pandemic that unemployment was over 8% in Ireland. This was during the, the height of the, the first lockdown, and uh, we know Ireland's in an, another lockdown, so we'll see where the unemployment situation goes. But what we see is really communities everywhere are having to manage rising unemployment, and especially as they look at the local small businesses and even large multinationals that are shutting their doors, downsizing, or freezing hiring. One of the, the things we've been looking at are, you know, what are the sectors that have been most impacted? And, and we really see that those places that are heavily relying on tourism or have large hospitality um, and food services sectors are the ones that are really getting hit by COVID. And those are the sectors that have been most exposed to lockdown and social distancing measures. One of the other big shifts we've seen, as we're all, most of us at least are doing now, is a big shift to teleworking. So we see within Europe that the share of jobs generally amenable to teleworking is about 13 percentage points higher in cities compared to rural areas. But skills has a huge factor in explaining who can log in to telework. So when we look across the OECD, about 30% of workers can telework. However, the likelihood of the ability to telework decreases with, for workers without tertiary education. So in Ireland, if we look at the analysis that we've done, about 50% of workers who could telework have a tertiary education at attainment level. This is compared to about 15% who don't. So skills is really a fundamental driver of this ability to telework, which we know is a huge source of resiliency in terms of people being able to keep their jobs and keep performing within the economy. We also see that COVID-19 has really had a disproportionate impact on certain groups of people. So low-skilled workers, young people, and women are in particular really bearing the brunt of the crisis. And this could dampen their earnings and opportunities for years to come. We know that labor market shocks can have you know, long-lasting impacts. We see this also on, on the firm side, looking at SMEs. Many SMEs are just being devastated and are just trying to survive right now. If we look right now at the, going back to the issue of youth unemployment, Ireland, interestingly, for young men, uh, the youth unemployment rate sits at about 21.4% versus about 16.6% for women. So really, there's some really ongoing labor market shocks that have this potential to exacerbate inequalities within the labor market and within our societies in general. The other thing, in addition to COVID that we're seeing is that COVID is really being an accelerator for existing structural trends that we were already seeing before the crisis. And here I'm talking about automation and digitalization. We've seen evidence from past crisis, from particular the 2008 global financial crisis, that downturns tend to accelerate automation. And we see that particularly with COVID and the emphasis on social distancing and the um, you know, technology, many firms will be looking to technology as a way to pandemic proof their operations in the future. And we know that automation can have a disproportionate impact on certain types of workers. And again, here, skills is fundamental. The jobs that are most likely to be replaced or impacted generally by technology are those that involve routine or repetitive tasks within the job. So jobs that involve more complex tasks that require generally higher levels of skills 
tend to be more resilient in terms of the overall impact on technology. So, you know, these are the big labor market changes we see. And, how, and, and again, I really want to emphasize the, the importance that these changes are going to impact regions differently within countries. Some regions are better prepared, some regions will be more resilient, and others are going to really face a hard hit going forward and may fall further behind. So what does it mean for education and skills policies? I think the pandemic really has clear implications for training and learning. Adult learning will become more important than ever as some sectors decline and workers face an increasing need to retrain or reskill. We've seen across the OECD that some countries are already moving ahead with big investments in training, recognizing the need to reskill people in certain sectors facing downturns. One good example um, comes from my home country of Canada. The government's investing billions of dollars in sectors like tourism, construction, hospitality to help workers in these sectors retrain so that when the, when the upturn happens, you know, they, they'll have relevant skills that they can find new opportunities as demand picks back up. Forcibly, as, as a result of the pandemic, we're also observing a breakthrough of online learning in general. So from the edu education provider perspective, you know, online learning has really proliferated. So there are pros and cons to online learning. We know from um, you know, the positive perspective that it can broaden access to learning at a low cost. However, there are challenges. Namely, it requires good digital skills. So if you're talking for certain disadvantaged groups, they may not have the adequate dis uh, digital skills to really fully take advantage. Um, you know, having the right computer equipment in place, and we know for certain disadvantaged groups, this can be a challenge. Um, on the educational provider perspective, you know, for teachers and educators in general, this is a big change, and it involves a big change in how they teach and, and curriculum delivery overall. So, you know, working with teachers to train them and, and getting them used to training online. Some teachers have probably found new and innovative ways of teaching, whereas others have probably had a big adjustment, relying more on the, the in-class teaching methods that have, have, have been uh, were normal before the pandemic. Now, we also see that for work-based learning and apprenticeship, that the system is really understressed, especially because we know that apprenticeship opportunities generally require a, a work-based training and a component where an apprentice needs to be on the job. So in, a, in an environment where we have to be socially distanced or we're in lockdowns and not able to actually go to work, this is a big challenge for those, um, those skills development frameworks. Um, Interestingly, if we look at the overall governance of the education and training system, we really see that the local or regional level is critical in ensuring programs are catered to local needs. So we did a survey across OECD countries looking at the design of adult education policies. We do see that it, you know, the policy responsibility generally does rest at the national level. However, in 33% of the countries that we uh, surveyed, we see that the subnational level actually has an active role in designing and driving policy design. And I think Ireland is a, a really good example of this with the education and training boards that are operating at the regional level and driving policy and, and funding um, to make sure that education and skills programs are meeting the needs of different regional labor markets. So going forward, I want to finish just basically talking about what the OECD is doing. Um, we have a number of projects underway. We're really trying to understand how cities are changing as a result of COVID-19, but also looking at the structural trends that were uh, in place before the crisis. Um, we're trying to understand how cities and regions can future-proof their adult learning systems by looking at how they can afford, provide more access to low-skilled people, more access to training, um, but also facilitating more training to firms. So we have an ongoing project right now that we're doing in collaboration with the J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation. We've started a review in London. London, interestingly, has taken on over 300 billion pounds in new adult education funding uh, through a devolution agreement. So we are providing advice to the city on how they can future-proof the economy and what their policy priorities should be going forward, and hoping to inform the next iteration of the Mayor of London's Skills for Londoners strategy. Um, so we started a review in 2020, and we're hoping to publish the report in 2021. Uh, in 2021, we're actually going to be starting work in Berlin, similarly, and we really see an opportunity within the OECD amongst regions and cities to facilitate more knowledge exchange around adult learning and learning about best practice from an implementation perspective and understanding what works. 
And we've actually been talking with the Cork Education and Training Board about the possibility of engaging in this work. So we, we, we really look forward to continuing to work with regions and cities across the OECD to look at how they're fostering lifelong learning, the challenges they're facing, and what are the opportunities going forward. So that's all from me, John. Thanks a lot. Sorry, it took me a bit longer to unmute. John, Jonathan, thank you so much for that really rich and broad uh, perspective, particularly a global perspective, and you prompted me to maybe put a few questions to you later, if that's okay. But before, for doing so, I might go to my good friend Raúl uh, Raúl uh, Valdez Catera, uh, and Raúl and I have travelled many parts of the world together. And those of us involved in lifelong learning and, and lifelong learning festivals and UNESCO will be very familiar with Raúl at various parts of the world. And just to acknowledge your contribution, Raúl, uh, to us at Cork, uh, but also more generally to learning, it, uh, and just to give you a shout out and say we say us in Irish Oscar get me and thank you. Um, so Raul is a, is a senior program specialist in UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning and a program manager of UNESCO Global Networks of Learning Cities. Raul holds an MBA and a PhD in education and Raul has led various research and advocacy projects such as unlocking the potential of urban communities and case studies of 12 learning cities uh, and is editor with uh, uh, Longworth and others. But that's a very small uh, uh, brief bio of Raul for those of us who have been involved in learning cities in Cork and many parts of the world. Raul is well known to us and we, we hugely appreciate the, the, the support, your guidance, advice that you've always provided. So we're really excited to have you here this morning, Raul, and, and hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you, John, very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure, really, for the opportunity to be here with you today at this important webinar on mitigating against educational disadvantage in court, city and region. And particularly this session on international perspective where Jonathan already gave a very, uh, very nice perspective. <clears throat> I'm here today as representative of the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning, which is based in Hamburg, Germany. And more specifically in this uh, flagship program that uh, has been so relevant in, in this pandemic time, the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities, which is a network that has uh, 229 cities of varying size uh, cities from 64 countries from, from all uh, world regions, all of which are actively working towards realizing this culture of lifelong learning for all at the local level. You know, John, when in 2019, members of the UNESCO Global Network of Learning Cities acknowledge health and well-being as one of the most important topics for the network to focus on, none of us could predict that the year to follow would challenge societies really around the world with a global crisis, such as this COVID-19 pandemic. And of course, this includes the cities of Cork and uh, Osan in, in uh, um, Republic of Korea that took the lead to coordinate this cluster. With this pandemic, the importance of quality health education has, uh, like never before, become so evident. <clears throat> the COVID-19 pandemic has led to global learning disruption of an unprecedented scale and severity. It closed schools, universities, and other learning institutions that have been affecting the lives of 1.6 billion students in over 190 countries. The UN Secretary General warned early this year that the pandemic has amplified social, economic, and digital inequalities, putting a, generational, a, a total generation at risk of a learning catastrophe. At the same time, it has helped showcase the role of education as the pillar for every society as a public common good and the bedrock of social cohesion, well-being, and opportunity. I think that the disruption has had and will continue to have substantial effects beyond education. The closing of education institutions hinders the provision of essential services for children and communities, including access to nutrition food, affects many parents' ability to work, and increases the risk of violence against women and girls. Shortly after this first European lockdown in June 2020, a framework for reporting schools was jointly released by UNESCO, UNICEF, the World Bank and the World Food Programme. This was a result of an urgent need to reopen healthy and safe schools for all learners, based on an assessment of the benefits and risk of such actions. 
The publication gives an insight about why schools should open and detail the process of reopening. But taking into consideration key dimensions such as the policy, the financing, safe operation, learning, reaching the most marginalized, uh, well-being, protection, etc. Some of the key recommendations uh, are useful for city representatives uh, include, for example, the point of the decision making that should be done together with subnational stakeholders. So the actions are based on an analysis of each local context. Another example is that education authorities should strengthen communication and coordination mechanisms that promote local dialogue and engagement with communities, parents, and children on education matters. This particular example was one that could uh, be seen in action in many of our uh, cities in the, in the GMLC. They actively engage with the whole community, uh, with the whole neighborhood, with the family in uh, the early days of the pandemic. And finally, another recommendation is to provide schools leaders with clear guidance and to maintain regular contact with local health authorities. And of course, updating emergency plans and contact lists, uh, something that, again, we have seen in certain cities as a strategic focus of, foc of uh, coping with the pandemic. But you know, a couple of months later, uh, as more countries move into that direction, lessons began to emerge and some best practices of implementing these recommendations. And I would like just to name a few. <clears throat> Proactive planning and clear protocols for reopening together with flexibility in uh, decision-making can help limit outbreaks as well as disruptions. Or simplifying the curriculum. Or having specific measures to help to support girls and other vulnerable groups to return to school. Just to give you a case, in Burkina Faso was actively raising awareness about the importance of girls' education in its back-to-school campaigns and offering scholarship, school kids, and meals to the most vulnerable. Uh, in another uh, <clears throat> dimension, but also very important, UNESCO also promotes the mainstreaming of social-emotional learning throughout education and here uh, I would like to refer very strongly in the formal, non-formal and informal learning at all levels. Because, you know, in this pandemic, we saw the relevance of non-formal and informal learning. All learners, young and old, are affected by stress and insecurity. Only when the brain is socially connected and emotionally secure can it focus on academic context and, uh, and engage in learning in emergency situations, schools are a fundamental space for emotional support, for monitoring of risk, for educational continuity and social and material support for students and their families. Responses uh, be adapted to the diversity of situation in each uh, family and community. Uh, both health and education are a central focus of the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and its 17 Sustainable Development Goals. WHO declared that without health, the common goals and urgent needs will not be reached. No doubt about it. And in this statement, it's equally relevant for education. More than ever, we are testimonies of the connection between all SDGs. While education stopped, Learning did not. The UNESCO GNLC has worked hand in hand to share its solutions, not to only provide learning during the pandemic, but also overcoming the crisis itself. The cities during webinars, conferences, meetings and workshops discuss collaboratively the issue of learning being out of formal and non-formal education and explaining which measures, campaigns and partnerships work best. Some cities reported how they had discovered the importance of intergenerational family neighborhood and community learning, while others share concrete initiatives. In the context of distance and online learning, the family setting in itself constitutes and continues to be a learning environment in which parents, caregivers act as primary guides to support their children. 
just to to uh, let you know that uh, many many factors in the field of education had seen the pandemic as an opportunity to encourage families and communities to become more involved in learning and this is demonstrated perfectly by the city of cork where a covid 19 community response forum has been set up to help vulnerable members of communities and where 30 different partners organizers are working together seven days a week in order to help those in need and those looking for guidance and with this example i will stop it because i think it's one piece of what cities have been doing uh, in order to tackle the crisis all over the world thank you very much john Thank you very much, Raoul. And again, a tour de force across the world and bringing us to Korea, back to Cork and across the world and just sharing those really important values that, that are not just for UNESCO, but global uh, values, which we hugely, I love your, your phrase that education by the stock, but learning does not. I think this is something really special in that. And thank you for sharing that. And I'm really excited now we're going to come back to Ireland to Dr. Nia O'Reilly, who's the, the CEO of Intus, Ireland's La um, Adult Learning Organization. And Leave last evening I was watching um, on Post's uh, book award um, and it was this extraordinary woman um, and I wish I could remember her name who was interviewed by Miriam O'Callaghan uh, in last year's uh, awards and who was starting to learn for the first time and, and started to write a book herself and it was just an absolute inspiration um, to see the amount of work that Intus but also our educators are doing this, this role model and you know this idea if you can't see it you can't be it and I think we all seek role models every day. So it's just fantastic to have you here this morning Niamh, to give your perspective and just to remind everybody on the webinar that Intus is committed to advocating for the right of all adults in Ireland, a quality service for adult learners throughout their lives and promoting the value and benefits of lifelong learning. Intus supports learners, particularly educationally disadvantaged learners, to engage in lifelong learning and it advocates for more inclusive national educational policies. Intus plays a pivotal role in advocating for adult and community education both national and international level and we're lucky enough that it's led by an outstanding scholar herself Dr Niamh O'Reilly. Niamh good morning and thank you I'm looking forward to your considerations thank you. Good morning John thanks very much I'm delighted to be uh, virtually in court for the second time this year um, I'm very much going to pick up on that point that you mentioned with regard to the transformative um, perspective of learning and the learner's perspective I, I wanted to talk about educational disadvantage from a national perspective and how adult learning responds to this and very much bring the grassroots perspective. I really enjoyed colleagues Raoul and Jonathan's input. I'm very much going to come from a grassroots perspective. When we're talking about the issues of educational disadvantage, I would just want to touch on the people, the issue and the policies. So in terms of the issue at national level, in terms of participation in adult education, it's around 12.5% of the lifelong learning participation rate. But for people who've left school early, it's around 3%. The programme for government is looking at a target of 18% for 2025. And the focus in AIMFIS is really about widening participation. And I think what we've learned over the pandemic is that the issue of access is very complex and it's really compounded by the broader structural issues and inequalities. And issues that existed pre-COVID really came into light, particularly with regard to poverty, homelessness, domestic violence, racism, isolation, talked about mental health issues, and the lack of support such as childcare and finance, the multitude of issues that people face. And again, compounded again by the challenges of remote learning, while in some instances, learners have really enjoyed the experience, the ability to have a safe space to learn for disadvantaged learners, the access to devices and broadband, capacity to be able to engage on online learning is really challenging. But behind those statistics are people, and in the name we talk to learners, and they tell us about their long-held aspirations in terms of engaging in education, and that the challenges that they have experienced over the years, that the road back to education is very difficult, it's a winding road, but overwhelmingly it's transformative and a really positive experience for themselves, for their families, and the wider community. So we ask ourselves, what can we do to enable everybody to be able to return to education and fulfill their educational aspirations, whatever they may be? And in terms, what we know is that we talk about the Matthew effect, those who've gained most in education continue to gain, and we really need to widen the, the access. We know cohorts of the population, particularly in Ireland, didn't derive the same benefit from the education system. And we really need to have a specific focus, particularly with the fallout of the COVID pandemic. Learners with disabilities, 
traveler and Roma populations, people who are caring, women, and we've mentioned that as well, learners in direct provision and disadvantaged minorities, the homeless and people with literacy, numeracy and digital skills challenges, and people in receipt of social welfare. And the challenges that they face um, have to be front and center of all of our efforts. We've talked about in the brilliant work with regard to the learning cities in Cork, and yet educational inequalities are also due to geographic like, um, locations, such as in urban or rural areas. And the Higher Education Authority just this week um, set out some really interesting data on spatial and socioeconomic profile of higher education uh, with regard to the deprivation index. And if we map out the adult learning provision in those areas, we have done a little bit of analysis this week where you have community education based on areas of deprivation that has a significant impact on people's opportunity to engage in learning, but also higher education. And there's a vast range of policies that are focusing on educational quality in Ireland. We have the further education training strategy. One of the goals is about fostering inclusion. We have the new 10-year literacy, numeracy and digital skills strategy that has been uh, developed. The action plan of apprenticeships, which is very much focused on access. Only 5% of women engage in apprenticeships. With the program for government, the new higher education access plan. So with all of these plans that are happening, what we've learned over the experience of COVID is that coming together in the post-secondary, taking a tertiary approach to access really has value. Um, with the Department of Further Higher Education Research Innovation Science just set up under Minister Harris, there really is a drive towards education equality. And during the COVID pandemic, the department set up a mitigating education disadvantage working group and the same title of this conference. And what we found is that there are common issues across the board in community education, further education, higher education. The same themes apply with regard to the issues that learners face, how they're addressed are different. So just to move now to really think about, well, what does adult education do to respond to educational disadvantage? And I want to talk about what we have in Ireland and to really harness the incredible expertise that is here. Um, to learn from our colleagues internationally, but to recognize some three, uh, three areas I want you to look at which is around voice, community, and unity. And with regard to voice, when in AIMFAS, we are always trying to engage with learners in the most authentic way and hearing their voice. So from that perspective, we really need to engage those who are the focus of access policy and practice need to be partners in creating inclusive educational systems. Getting the perspectives of learners and communities is absolutely essential in that. And voice is a central part of adult education and it really responds to educational disadvantage in a number of ways. Firstly, in the kinds of provision that we offer, hearing learners themselves, identifying what their need is at local level, and trying to engage them in the process of trying to look at what is the best kind of education provision that can be offered at a practice and a policy level. The next piece is around the pedagogic process, um, harnessing the voice, and for many learners who have been silenced over the years, it's really part of building their capacity, their agency, their self-belief to be able to take up various um, educational opportunities that are there. And we have great examples of this, really uh, frarian informed pedagogic processes in community education, in ETBs and in higher education, accredited and non-accredited. Also in terms of like, shaping policy and practice, we need to look at a really robust evidence base. And in terms of research, there's a real value in qualitative research and having convergent views of asking us questions rather than trying to tell us the answers we already know, of listening to learners. AIMPAS leads out on the National Prep Learner Forum and we work in collaboration with ETBs. And we do that to understand the learners' perspectives. It's from the largest um, mixed methods learner voice project in Europe. And we strive for a transformative learner voice perspective to influence policy. And learners voice their issues and give us a lens to understand the impact of the policies that we have. And I just want to give you a quote because if I'm talking about learner voice, it should come from the learners themselves and not just me. Um, Daniel Kenny, who's doing a, an apprenticeship in Barbara, he talks about learner, um, to me learner voice is about getting um, your voice out there. It's how we want to be, um, it's how we want things to be done. It's really personal because it's not just anybody's voice, it's your voice. And just another quote from Liam Shorthall, who's from Limerick Clary TV. Everyone's voice is as important as everyone else's. And I think that for so many people, for various reasons, their voice has been and is still muted over the years. Education can be a route away from that muted voice. Knowing that learners are listened to and they can input in their own education is so important. And I think we really need to look at learners um, as equal partners and the value of qualitative learning informed research in that. 
that's with regard to voice and I suppose that moves on to community and in Ireland we have a homegrown inclusive model of community education uh, that is also reflected in the Grail report and is very well recognised at an international level and it's something that I think we really need to foster and support. It engages people in educationally disadvantaged areas by offering flexible part-time accredited and non-accredited provision and a package of supports that address those multitude of issues that learners face childcare, counselling, domestic violence supports, um, and career guidance. And those organisations have a specific social justice uh, aim. I mean, educational equality is the whole focus of community education and is very much informed by Paolo Ferreri and his thinking. And in terms of the value that that can offer in terms of educational disadvantage and addressing it, it respects, it meets people, it understands their perspective, respects them, and it's an authentic human interaction that is based on love, care and solidarity and has a commitment to social change. So in terms of the provision in Ireland, Angus um, oversees a community education network with over 100 members who are part of that. And we're trying to do a piece of research as a CEN census to understand the impact of community education, but most importantly, how it's funded. One of the key things that we want to look for is sustainable funding for the non-formal, non-accredited provision that builds people's capacity. Um, earlier this year, uh, during the Adult Learners Festival, we had a Star Awards and I'm thinking of the Dillon's Cross project won a Star Award based in Cork. And this project is a community based project where female relatives of prisoners and ex prisoners provide are provided opportunities to reach their educational aspirations. So the value and the impact and behind the statistics are the people and the impact that uh, return to education has is so powerful. As one learner, Willie Coakley from Dublin Adult Learning Centre said, it's a place of healing. And when we look at structural issues, um, a lot of the learners that we are trying to engage and people who are at the lower levels of NFQ have experienced trauma and the um, effects of the injustices of poverty. So going forward on a more positive note is around unity. And I'm thinking um, the ain't this actually means unity. And 51 years ago, we were set up with the support of UCC. So coming back to the roots there a little bit. And one thing that we found out during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is that we really need coherence and support to build the expertise and draw on that expertise um, across further higher education and community education. So I think what's happening in the learning cities and the forthcoming strategy um, that's happening in Cork is really powerful and a really uh, focused way of addressing education and equality. When we developed um, the Mitigating Education Disadvantage Working Group as part of the COVID-19 response, it was a unique structure. It, took, it brought together people who wouldn't have engaged before with a singular focus on educational quality, looking at an evidence base. And we've 10 different papers that have been produced and hopefully we'll be able to support um, different actions that are taken going forward. We looked at specific issues around um, online learning and things that we've mentioned before. But I just want to end on a final point from Noel Hanrahan, who's an adult learner from Limic Limic Clare ETB. They're getting a lot of a shout out here, but I just wanted to, uh, give his perspective because we're launching a booklet next week on the FET Learner and the 10 stories of FET Learners who shared their voice through the National FET Learner Forum. And he says, so for people making decisions, they need to be reminded of those intrinsic little things that link everything together. It isn't just education, what it does for mental health and all forms of health also has to be considered. It spreads goodness through society, it's more holistic. And how we can capture and understand the perspectives of learners for shaping policy and practice and for us to really collectively um, make huge effort going forward with regards to the fallout of the pandemic is something that we're hoping in AIMPUS that there will be a commitment, a policy level for a structure that's going to be dedicated to education um, equality across the tertiary system. So I look forward to some discussion now and I'll hand back to yourself, John. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Niamh. Uh, there was so much in there and that was rich. I, I, I'm going to come back to your final point and, and, and bring me back to something that Raoul also said, that holistic uh, approach to learning. Uh, I, many years ago, I chaired the board of management of a primary school. Um, and I was always struck that the primary school principal was a wise woman who said to me, you know, you can't educate a hungry child. Um, and, you know, when I hear what Raoul has said, what you have said and what Jonathan have said, um, you know, at this moment in this pandemic, um, I think what we have seen is we're coming back to basics of, of the basic human needs of food, of security, 
of welfare. And if we don't have those pieces in place, it's very hard to learn. Um, so I'm just going to ask each of you maybe, and maybe I will start with you, Niamh, if that's okay. What have we learned from this current time that we might want to keep? And one of the things that we would want to go back to, if you like. So uh, I've been using the phrase, it's maybe a very bad metaphor, but I'm a biologist and uh, some, of you, some of you may know that evolution happens every day, but there are some great big steps in evolution uh, where animals came out of the water as fish and they went on to lands and down, anybody's down in Kerry and Valencia will know there's the, a world famous tetrapod footprints as a geological fossil. Um, and once you come out of the water as an evolutionary process, you can't go back. So if you can imagine, once you've gone somewhere, you just can't go back, it's, it's, it's just not possible. So my question is, what might we do that we haven't done before, that we've certainly has happened now and we might accelerate that, but what do we need to bring back to the system that we had previously? Niamh, I might start with you, given what you've reflected and what you've heard from Raoul and Jonathan as well. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. Um, I'm a biologist in my background too, oh, so well, I have nothing okay. in common yeah. there. <laughs> um, one of the things, again, going back to the mitigating educational disadvantage of working group and being able to draw on all of the expertise across the tertiary system, um, we came up with a tertiary education learner supports uh, structure, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And just going back to basics, so what do we need in terms of supporting access, engagement, retention, progression, positive learning experience and student success across the board? And there were six pillars uh, that came up with regard to that. And number one, a bit like what you mentioned there, with regard to like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, basic needs need to be met in terms of funding, uh, additional things like childcare and devices to be able to engage in learning. The second thing was around learner and student supports to be able to navigate the system. Having that one-to-one -one support, counselling and, and guidance is absolutely essential. The third thing is around peer support and the glue that keeps people on the course. Uh, how do you create um, communities of support and practice on, in an online context that will build that social capital, that connection, the sense of belonging? The next piece that we looked at was with regard to wellness to learn. Exactly. If, if, you, if you're not well, you can't learn. So in terms of mental health and well-being, one-to-one -one supports. And in terms, again, how do we engage learners who are not engaging at the moment? We know that there's been about 15% drop off of people uh, who are around like level three, four and five in the National Framework of Qualifications. How do we engage with them? And it is going back to previous work around uh, outreach and engagement, getting out in the community. That's something that we need to start really doing again. Mm. Uh, we did it in the 80s and 90s of going into communities, libraries, doctors, surgeries, uh, shopping centres, but that really authentic outreach and knocking on doors is going to be essential, particularly for the cohorts of learners. Um, of having that mentoring, there's a huge potential for recognition of prior learning. And then, as was finally what we looked at was like a blended learning support of enabling people to be able to learn in an online context and having the study space. So we had six pillars. So I think, you know, reflecting on, on that, there's the areas that we learned as a collective. Um, and I think we need to kind of go back and look at the value of what we have. I think Ireland uh, has an unbelievable community of people committed to educational quality and it's bringing forth their expertise and recommendations together with learners to be able to move forward. Thank you, Nia. Raoul, I might go to you next. What might we keep? What might we accelerate to uh, past this COVID period in education? Uh, yes. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think that, um, I mean, there are many things that I would like to say. Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not a biologist, but I will um, uh, try to move more into these uh, technological uh, futures because, you know, there's a trend now that technology is going to be the, the solution. <clears throat> At least when we're thinking a culture of lifelong learning, uh, always technology comes like uh, the, the big advantage and, and I would say uh, even if, if we see uh, the future of technologies uh, uh, as entreated with the social, economic, political culture um, and I think it's, it's in a way uh, uh, in the way to go there are also some tensions around it and I think it, it needs further discussion because it's something that uh, uh, we cannot have as as, uh, as granted, no? And, you know, tensions in terms of environmental sustainability, for example. 
I mean, we're thinking on devices, we're thinking on access, we're thinking, yeah, but, but this is not sustainable. And the planet is, is mm. it's, it's really mm. crashing on that. But also the tensions between the commercial and, uh, and the commons. Mm. I mean, we are, uh, uh, the, the companies are taking our, 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 our information. So how to get, get back to the commons? Mm. <clears throat> not, not public and private, but <clears throat> really for the community. Then the tension between inclusivity and exclusivity. I think this is a big issue because again, technology is bringing, uh, uh, as, as uh, we heard already from this Matthew effect. No, I mean, it's reading, bringing the ones that were already in education, but really excluding the, the, the most vulnerable groups. And, and something very important, the tensions in this technology between personalization and collectivism. Right. I think this is also something to discuss because really we are learning in this uh, pandemic the relevance of, of taking care of ourselves, of the others, and of the planet. So we cannot maintain our uh, personal view any longer. I'll Thank keep you. it here. Thank you, Rod. I think that's really, I, I, there's so much going there. Well, um, and I, as a university, Cork this week, we were announced that the the ninth, the ranked ninth in the world in sustainability. So it's something that's core to our values and core to the city. So, you know, what you said there, it just resonates at so many levels for me. So thank you for that. Jonathan, I might go to you. What might we keep? What might we, we accelerate at this time? Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, so I, I'm going to start with a bit of an analogy. So even though I work for the OECD, which is 37 countries, I, I mentioned my background being from Canada. Canada, there's a very popular sport uh, we call hockey. Some people in Europe know it as ice hockey. And there's a very famous player named Wayne Gretzky, known as the Great One. And he has this, this quote, basically, about the puck. And the puck, as you know, if you, well, if you don't know hockey, the puck is you shoot it in the net to score a goal. And he said, don't go where the puck is, go where the puck is going to be. And the point of this quote is you need to anticipate and have foresight about change. And I think, you know, this question is an interesting question. And what do you want to keep? And, what can we go back? I mean, in, in many ways, we can't go back on some no. things. So it's about managing. And I think in technology, when we talk about that, I think in many, in many situations, we just can't go back. But we have to find ways to, uh, as Raul said, you know, have technology um, improve our well-being and, and, and use it to, take, to, to basically make, make us better off. And I think that's part of the challenge right now is the adoption of technology has gone at such a rapid pace and it's been such a disruptive force that, you know, in many cases, it's, it's increasing inequality and there is indeed this trade-off and looking at what is the role of government policy to make sure that technology enhances individual and worker well-being. And that's something I think for policymakers all over the world that really need to, to, to think. And I think, you know, online learning is here to stay. And, and so I think it's really thinking about, you know, who is online learning best for? Which learners? And in what situations once we get into a post-COVID? Uh, but I think the things, you know, I think what COVID has also showed us is the value and of the face-to-face -face and, and, and the social networks and the social capital that we get by being in face-to-face -face environments when learning or interacting. And I, I think, you know, my observations of, of Ireland talking about community-based approaches is Ireland always has a very high degree of social capital at a, at a regional and local level. People know each other, they pick up the phone, they talk. And so this, 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 this sense of community in Ireland is, is very strong relative to other countries. And I think one of the other things, you know, that's just really important going forward is, you know, finding ways to merge education with social and employment policy. Because we talked about this kind of broad dementia, or broad um, complexity that many learners face in, in achieving success. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a multitude or multifaceted approach that needs to be taken that, you know, the, the education system has a role, but the social system has a role, whether it's addressing poverty or, you know, well-being and equality and the employment system, because it's also about, you know, having a job at the end of the day too, right? So having these systems integrated and working together toward the common goal is something that will really be quite important for the future going forward. So thanks a lot. Great, thank you. And we're coming very close to the end. So I'm going to ask you, to, Santa's coming, Christmas is coming. Um, so if you had one wish um, for equality in education, uh, and I'm going to start with you, Raul, this time. Um, so your very quick wish for 2021 and for our community. 
thank you. Well, I just would like to stress the importance of the dialogue and interrelation between education and health. This year uh, has been uh, uh, crucial for understanding this dimension, and I think we should keep it and 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 think uh, on this all over the uh, the coming years. Thank you, Raul. Jonathan. I mean, I think for me, my wish is that. Every, everybody just becomes even more aware of the importance of skills and education overall. I think there's still more that needs to be done, especially for adult learning, about building a sense and a culture of, of lifelong learning. I know there's lots of great work being done in Cork and by organizations like UNESCO, but continuing the momentum will be really important. Thank you, Jonathan. And Niamh? So from Santa, what I would want around educational <laughs> equality, um, that we have a really learner-centered, learner-led mm. education system that mm. responds to their educational aspirations, that they have the opportunity to build their capacity and then to move into sustainable employment, absolutely a vi vital with regard to poverty, but is that the learner is at the heart of any system that we create. Great, thank you so much. Dave, Raoul and Jonathan, thank you so much. As we conclude at this session uh, of the Cork Learning City, I think, I think we should be really proud of what we've all achieved collectively, globally and locally. Um, I think the role of the educator has really emerged um, as the unsung heroes, actually, I think, of the pandemic. We've got fantastic frontline workers, not taking away from those, but those mums and dads who educated at home, who educated in schools, who went out and did some amazing things. I'm incredibly optimistic to the future. I'm optimistic for two reasons. First of all, 100 years ago today, Cork City was almost burned down to the ground. Um, so there's a fire that destroyed most of Cork City, and we recovered fully from that. More importantly, University College Cork was built during the, the worst famine that ever hit this country, where we lost over 4 million people to emigration and debt from famine, and yet we built the university. That's the kind of resilience that we need in our people. That's the kind of people we have in Cork. That's the kind of people we have in Ireland to enable a centred learning that you've described, Niamh. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this morning. Raoul, thank you. I wish you all well. Colleagues, happy Christmas. Niamh, lovely to see you. And Jonathan, take care, and thank you very much. Thank you to John, Jonathan, Raoul and Eve for your unique and thought-provoking perspectives, which will certainly contextualize and inform our future plans. Now our next panel will explore diverse perspectives, mitigating against educational disadvantage through numerous lens, including health, disability, culture, socioeconomic background. The panel will bring both their professional and personal experiences of education highlighting the barriers and what would enable and support access. Uh, welcome back and thank you, Dennis, for your introductions there and to my good colleague, uh, President John O'Halloran from UCC for chairing the previous session. So our final session today will explore global actions and local actions. And here with us, we'd like to welcome Dr. Martin Davron, Director of the Sexual Health Centre, uh, my colleague, Leanne McDonough, uh, who is the CIT Traveller Education Coordinator, James Leonard, uh, will be joining us online uh, from Cork ETB and uh, famed for the Two Norries podcast. Also joining us online will be Roshi Normand, who is a master's student in, in CIT and the Access Office as well, and Sibusi Malofa, who is a sanctuary scholar, and Sibusi will also be joining us online. And finally, we have here in the studio, we have John Fitzgibbons, uh, who is the Director of Further Education and Training in Cork ETB. So maybe turning first, Martin, to yourself um, in terms of your own uh, initiatives and the initiatives you've seen that have worked in terms of health, health and education, sexual gender identity and so on. Maybe you can give us some examples uh, of successful initiatives uh, that you've experienced or indeed that you'd like, to, you'd like to advance further. So Martin, hand it off to yourself. Thanks, Lillian. I think for us, it's very clear that Education is a foundation to all aspects of our health and well-being, never more so than in the area of sexual health. If we have good quality education, we can really demystify misconceptions that are out there in many areas, and this happens all the time in the area of sexual health. Um, for us, over the past couple of years, we've been trying to further the dialogue away from the heteronormative dialogue that we see in Irish society all too often. I mean, you just have to look at the media, look at advertising campaigns, marketing campaigns. It's often heterosexual couples or heteronormative identities that we see. And so that doesn't form an inclusive environment, an inclusive society that we've seen in Ireland 
evolve over the past 30 years. For us, we've looked to organisations like Belong To, who recently published their climate survey in schools. They found 75% of students reported that they'd felt harassed in school. 30% hadn't turned up to school one day in the previous month because they felt they couldn't. They felt that the environment that they were in wasn't actually conducive to learning. And that really impacts on their academic attainment. It impacts on their ability for feeling included in a society that is for them. It leads to feelings of isolation. And that's something that all of us as a society have to be good bystanders in. All of us have to tackle. So with that in mind, I think we really need to consider education when it comes to gender and sexual identity in terms of the system, but also in terms of the individual. So for the system, you know, there's wonderful things that have been done and that we can continue to do. We can continue to think of the policy level, the educators, the young people themselves that are involved in education system and us and what we can do for people. In terms of the education system, we can think about things like inclusive environments, belong to do a stand up awareness week and all of that sends a message to the entire school community, to us as a society, about what we believe in, what we stand for, and how we can aid in supporting people. Educators require good facilitation skills. They require training in how to navigate this new Ireland, to support young people in what they need. And I'm delighted that the Sexual Health Centre were able to launch WISE this week, an online e-learning training platform for educators and youth workers so that they can update their training in relation to sexual and gender identity, but also support the young people that they work with on an everyday basis and provide them with accurate, informed information that's evidence-based, but that's also timely and is inclusive to their needs at that point in time. And I think then we have to be really thankful to the historical backdrop that we look at. There has been 30 years of change in this area, and that's thanks to activists. It's thanks to people around us that have seen the need for that change, that have called on Ireland to be more inclusive, and that have furthered a safer environment for each of us. And that safe environment needs to be advocated for into the future. So thanks. Well, thank you very much, Martin, and some good insights there. And maybe we switch now to, to Leanne McDonough, who is an outstanding ambassador uh, for the Crawford College of Art and Design, that have be said. Uh, but maybe just to talk this morning, Leanne, about the importance of ethnic and culturally aware education systems and how we can support. And I know you're heavily involved yourself with, with the, the Traveller Higher Education Network, so maybe you might give us some examples of initiatives you've seen and that you'd like to to, to advance forward. Thanks, Leanne. Thank you, Barry. Um, I suppose to begin, before I could advise anybody on what would be best to advance forward, I would like to um, share with you the fact that my experience of the education system here in Ireland has been an extremely positive one. Um, and I have absolute love in my heart for Crawford and for CIT. Um, but I suppose when I left Crawford and decided to become a teacher, um, I began working in a lot of schools throughout the city here in Cork and across the board in all of Ireland. And I began to realize that not every other traveler had the same positive experience as me. Um, and I came across a lot of examples and instances where children unfortunately began dropping out of school because of different experiences that they were having. And this is something that really, really stayed with me. So when I had the opportunity to work as a Traveller Education Coordinator with Cork Institute of Technology, I was really happy because it enabled me to develop two very important initiatives. Um, one of which is um, a work experience programme. Um, and the reason why I feel really, really strongly about the work experience programme is because I've met numerous young students that have actually dropped out of school because they cannot obtain work experience in their locality when it is needed of them. Um, and that is something that is absolutely detrimental to a child as an individual, let alone their experience um, with an educational system or the world of work. So I've been trying to create um, 
a database of companies that are willing to invite young travellers into their workspaces and to provide them with valuable experience going forward. Um, this is something that is of extreme importance because I am met with um, a very narrow mindset from a lot of young travellers who say to me on a daily basis, what is the point in education if we will not get a job at the end of the day? Unfortunately for a lot of young kids within the travelling community, education needs to equate to a job. It needs to equate to employment. Um, and unfortunately, that is not the case. So that is one of the initiatives that I am front running. The other one is the Traveller Graduate Network, which Barry mentioned. And that is a network created by travellers, specifically for travellers. And I have reached out to all tra traveller students who have either continued with their education through further or higher education. And we have come together um, and our main aim is to create more inclusive learning and working environments. And that is going very, very strong. Um, we met this week and we have high hopes for the future. But I suppose the most important thing um, to keep in mind is, yes, I am aware there is numerous supports out there and there's a lot of colleges and organizations and, and different representatives reaching out and trying to get different people from different backgrounds involved in education. But sometimes um, it takes a little bit more than that. Sometimes it really takes pushing a lot of people around the table and actually listening and listening to those people's views and listening to what might work for them. And unfortunately, sometimes um, we might have to use the word um, bend the rules a little or um, be more open minded or think differently about how we can deliver different courses, because unfortunately, um, not one course will fit all. Um, and this, I think, might just be the case for the traveling community. And even though there's a lot of different um, personalities within that community, um, I think possibly an alternative type of course or education might be the way to go. Um, so I, I would be really, really keen to see what we might develop um, down the line in relation to that. Um, and I think for now, that is me. Thank you very much, Leanne. I think you made a good connection there already with, say, Paula Cogan's contribution this morning from the, from the Chamber in terms of the, the importance of work experience and work placement and the whole road model situation. So uh, we may come back to that later on. Uh, now we're joined online by James Leonard. James Leonard, uh, famous for, uh, I think, a Tommy Tiernan interview and the two Norris and so on. So James, you might uh, come back to us again in terms of uh, talk to us about uh, the different pathways that you've experienced, particularly returning to education. And as Leanne said there, it's not one size fits all, which I think we've been guilty of for, for many a generation. So maybe James, you might give us your own experiences there. Thanks. Uh, thanks a million, and it was great listening to everybody so far. I suppose my experience of education has been mixed in terms of positive and negative. And um, primary school was great, secondary school was awful. Um, a re-traumatizing experience I found, and I left secondary school thinking I was stupid, and that education wasn't for me. Um, and there were core beliefs I held. Um, I had a very troubled 20s then, which is well publicised by now. But eventually I was able to get myself into recovery and sort myself out. Um, I suppose my education journey started when I linked in with um, an ETB tutor, uh, Paul, a very nice man. And it was a basic uh, computer literacy course, because I knew I had to learn how to use a computer. Um, to do anything in, in this day and age, I need to be computer literate. So I became more confident then when I did on that course. And then I applied to the College of Commerce and I done applied psychology and social studies there. Again, a wonderful experience. Um, I was the oldest in my class. Um, I felt like an antique, but at the same time, um, I, it was really enjoyable and I was learning about psychology and social class. And I really began to understand my background and I suppose who I am um, and where I'm from. Um, then I wanted to get a job. Um, like Liam was saying, I wanted to get a job where I could, uh, I wanted to do a course where it would um, help me to get a job. So the best one for me at the time was Uton Community Work in UCC. Um, and I did a three-year bachelor's there. Um, and I started working then in homeless services in Hawk. Um, I was lucky enough to get a good grade and a scholarship for a master's, which I done uh, criminology. Um, and I was lucky enough again to get a good grade and to get a scholarship for a PhD which I'm doing at the moment. It's employment-based PhD. Um, 
between Cork ETB and Department of Sociology and Criminology UCC. And I'm looking at how people uh, reintegrate into society from prison and recovery, how they experience further and higher education. I suppose some of the initiatives we're working on at the moment, um, then is looking at, I suppose, making faces of FET more visible. Maybe, uh, I suppose, uh, as you said earlier on, I have a podcast, my own podcast as well. If I can bring some of this, them skills into my employment and um, maybe run a podcast series of um, people who have been through FET and higher education from non traditional backgrounds and just making them more visible. Because, there's, I, yeah, maybe I'm a successful story, but there's loads of uh, people like me out there. We just don't get to hear them or they don't have the platform. So that's what I'm trying to do with my podcast and on my employment. And another thing we're working on at the moment as well is um, trying to bridge the gap between youth work and FET. So for young people that finish school, but maybe they're not ready for College of Commerce, St. John's or um, some of the other um, colleges for education, um, running something maybe with the youth service, um, maybe taster courses, um, I suppose, kind of just to uh, prepare them for FET. You know? So there's a lot of... Um, our, there's a substantial amount, especially in my local area, of young people finish school but not at the moment in employment, education or training. And I think that they are vital. it's vital that we target them. Um, I suppose some of the issues then that I kind of run into would be um, funding options for part-time learners, especially for mature students where um, they might have families or mortgages or rents and full-time education would be an option. They're very limited in terms of part-time options. Also, Susie's system designed for traditional learners. Um, I remember when I when I was going through Susie, um, because I stayed in my parents' home for one of the previous five years, I was classed as a dependent, and Susie basically taught me get the money out my parents. That that's not a reality, and that's an issue for a lot of mature students, um, especially in this day and age with a homeless crisis and the way the property situation is at the moment. More and more mature students stay at home for longer. Uh, it's unfair then for somebody in their twenties and thirties to have to ask their parents or to be seen by Susie as a uh, dependent on their parents. They might be living in the home, but they can still be independent. So we're doing a lot of things well, but there's a lot of work to do at the same time. Um, and it's great to be part of the conference. And thanks for the invitation. Well, thank you, James. And it does raise a couple of issues there. Particularly, what is the definition of student success? You know, what is success for? For, for A, it may not be successful, B, uh, it depends, but, and that's what access comes into it. And again, and you, you, you finished up there in terms of the actual supports. And again, I suppose the supports are there maybe for, for the vast majority in terms of the Susie system is one, but I think flexibility is required as well. And maybe, maybe John Fitzgibbons might throw a bit of light in that uh, uh, in the finish up. So thanks to James. And back to, back to CIT again, or to online to Roisin, Roisin Ormond, who was a master's student in CIT and is also a student and disability rights activist and doing great work. So maybe from your own experience, Roisin, you might you might uh, you know outline what supported you and what was driving you on to, to increase access to, to other students. Um, thanks, Barry, for the instruction. Um, so, uh, so a bit about me. Um, I'm hearing impaired. Um, I wear two hearing aids um, every day. They're the first thing I put on in the morning, last thing I take I take off at night. Um, and I've been hearing impaired since birth. Sorry. Um, and so I've always worn hearing aids in school. Um, and I also li 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 lip read, um, so um, which is really hard um, at the moment with everyone going around with masks. Um, and just a bit about the hearing loss. Um, I suppose a lot of people think, okay, you can hear at a lower rate, you know. Um, but actually, you know, if someone talks to me um, and they say it, um, about 20 words, I probably miss about five five words out of that. Um, and in my head, I'm always trying to work out what they've said. Um, and this is a huge issue for me, you know, in education, when you're trying to make sure you've got all the right information, you know, for an assignment. Um, and as far as I suppose my education journey has been um, a whirlwind, um, it's, there's been lots of ups and downs. Um, so in primary school, I would have had a lot of support. Um, and it was quite interesting. I, when I was deciding um, what uh, secondary school to go to um, you know I was remember trying to decide a local school or would I go to a deaf school um, and I remember um, I had someone who was very important um, in my education 
um, told me, you know, one day she was like, oh, so, so Rasheen, you know, you're you're not going to do your leaving cert, um, you're you're not going to go to third level, and um, so you don't really need to worry too much about what you're going to do. And I remember it being, you know, my twelve year old self, you know, in my head, going, you know, nodding, saying yes, but in my head, I'm um, going, no, I absolutely want to go to college. You know, um, it's been something my parents never went to college, and it was they've always, you know, told us, you know, myself, and my family, you know, we are, you know, you're going to go to college, um, no matter what, just because you're deaf, it doesn't mean that you can't go to college. Um, but from there, um, I, I pushed on. I remember um, trying to decide, you know, doing, in my leaving cert year, trying to decide what course to do. And um, CIT, I was really intrigued by CIT. Um, you know, they have smaller classroom sizes. And I knew for me, you know, um, I, was going, it was, I knew it was going to be, because I like having small classroom sizes. Um, and I suppose going to college, I was so nervous, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the student, you know, new students um, being hearing impaired, wanting to get all the information off the teachers and, um, I got great support from CIT um, in the DSS, um, and they, you know, I was able to get some a note taker, um, but a, a note taker where someone types out everything that's been said in the class, and that was a huge help for me. Um, you know, even to this day, you know, I'm doing a masters and I still have my some of so my note takers. Um, I always had the best notes, um, <laughs> and I was always in because they were always beside me. Um, it was great. Um, I absolutely loved it, and um, I suppose another thing for me as well, you know, in terms of Sports um, that I had, and um, I for exams, um, you know, when you're in a big hall, a lecture hall, there's like three or four hundred people, and I'd always be worried, you know, if I missed, you know, a change of question. So in, in, I wouldn't be writing; I'd be actually looking up and not really doing the paper. And I remember saying this, you know, to the DSS and especially to Laura, and um, you know, something that seemed so big to me um, was so easily changed. You know, I was able to get in my own room, and now everyone is. Difference. I know everyone's supports um, have, have different supports, but for me, it was a huge aspect. I was able to get out, get, get away from the anxiety that I was going to have. Um, and it was from there actually that um, there was an internship, an internship came up in CIT in the extra service, you know. And I was kind of blown away with all the support that I had received, even though they were so small. For me, they were huge. They were, um, and so I was. Very lucky. Um, I jumped at the chance um, at the internship, and I was in the CFT access service for two years, and I loved it. Um, it gave me great insight you know, to the supports that are there for students, um, and students that are a lot more off than me, you know, a lot more worse than me, you know, and seeing them, you know, come to college and achieve everything that they wanted. And it was it was kind of from there. Uh, I remember I was doing um, a project. It was called the Student Voice, and so I got to meet a load of different students from different backgrounds. Um, so we had actually the current um, current CIT access intern, Brenda Hogan was one of them, um, to the person's travelling committee. And I remember hearing her story and the setbacks that she had. And I thought it was just me. You know, I had that one person told me, you're not going to do it even so. And I was blown away. You know, there was 10 different stories in that, in that book. And everyone had something like that, where they had told them, no, you can't do that. And yet they've broken down that barriers. And I think that, you know, there's a lot barriers been set for different people and I think it's very important that everyone gets a chance to break them down. Um, and I suppose it was actually that those when I listened to those kind of stories, I remember deciding I'd only done a level seven. Sorry, I don't think I mentioned I did biomedical engineering um, level seven. And I remember you know debating will I go on and, and get my level eight. And it was I remember you know those day that we were um, sharing the stories about the student voice and it was there that I decided I'm actually going to go back again and I'm going to get my level eight. And since then, um, I got back and they got all the same support. And I've been very, very lucky. I know there are students um, in other colleges around the country, um, especially a friend of mine who's deafer than me and doesn't have the same support as I do, even though she's much worse off. So I know I'm very, very lucky. Um, I think there's been a, you know, there really needs to be um, a nationwide for all students, um, a disability or illness, and it seems it needs, it needs to be at the same level. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's very, very important, and it's it's used like in the last, you know, most releases um, results there recently, the 2018, 2019 uh, stats, and there was an increase of 220 students with today's DSS around DSS services around the country, and that's a huge number, um, and just that there is a lot of support needed and um, this area is really, really under Um 
Yeah, I think, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you, Roisin. And we're talking about student success and that actual publication, the student voice that you worked on. Uh, yeah, 10 different pathways, 10 different outstandingly successful students. So thanks for your contribution, Roisin. Really appreciate it. And now we turn back online again to Sibusi Malofia, who's a sanctuary scholar and benefited from the sanctuary scholarship scheme. Uh, and, you know, you're coming for, from a tough situation in terms of the whole um, direct provision. So maybe you, you might just give us your perspective on you know, developing culturally inclusive education systems and, of course, the whole practical side of it as well. So I hope yourself, Yuzi. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Um, so I was living in direct provision for three years. So direct is a place where asylum seekers live uh, they are waiting for the application to be approved uh, by the international So uh, direct provision has over 7,000 people and it was established in, it was introduced in terms of the year 2000. So, um, my educational experience is in distribution, like as an adult with limited skills, um, with so much limited scholarships, and also uh, most of the community centers are located in isolated places. So it's hard to reach out, it's hard to get to know where to go to seek for help, to elevate yourself in terms of education. And also with the children living in the region, it's so difficult because uh, it's hard to access the educational institutions and as well when they feel they're living there, it's hard to engage in third level education due to the documentation that's required that they don't have, like for example, the JNAP card or the valid passport. And as for me, um, when I was living in direct provision, I got an opportunity to engage in uh, level three of basic education uh, with the help from uh, Michael Lyons and his team. Then uh, from that, uh, I, ha I had no idea where I would uh, continue with my education uh, due to lack of information that we receive in direct provision. And I went to Co College of Commerce and then I tried to apply for a level five course. And then uh, then uh, I was told that I, I don't qualify for that because I don't have a journey card and a valid passport. So it was kind of like a setback to me, but I never gave up. Um, I, I joined the Sanctuary Runners, it's a group that uh, has three principles of solidarity, friendship, and respect. So that's when uh, people of uh, the Irish community is running alongside with the people from direct provision. So for that, I got to interact with the Irish community. Then I was asking for advice. That's when I got an opportunity of like how I can engage in education, even if there's obstacles, but there's some opportunities. Like for example, uh, I was advised that if I can go to St. Vincent, uh, they're able to pay for their part-time courses. So that's when I went to apply for reception and frontline office skills in Co College of Commerce. So I did it as a part-time course with the help from uh, St. Vincent. Then from there, um, I applied for the Central Scholarship in UCC. So it's another challenge as, an, as a mature student to secure a place there because there is limited spaces. Um, so I told myself that education is the only uh, is the only way for me to get rid of my distress, my anxiety, and all of that. So I worked very hard. I worked very hard to apply for the. I mean, to do the personal statement, to apply through the CAO, it was a challenge. And also, uh, I knew I had less chances of getting a place because uh, I didn't have an, any education background in Ireland, like, for example, a living set or something like that. So um, with the help from the team, from the Sanctuary Scholarship, I was able to secure a place 
and I was so grateful for that. And there's so much support from the Centralia Scholarship uh, in terms of education. Um, there are so many struggles that I face as a mature student. Like for example, I sometimes it's hard for me to keep up with college work, but with the support from the Central Scholarship team, I am able to stand firm and push myself and do better. And I was so surprised to see myself passing my first day. I'm like, oh my God, I never ever thought I would make it. <laughs> so um Central Scholarship really came as a positive impact in my life. It really changed my life. It made me um, to to view life in a different perspective, a positive. I, I have a positive approach to life because of the opportunity I was given by the UCC Central Scholarship. So um, that's it for me. Thank you very, very much, Lucy. And again, it shows, you know, the systems are there, but the initiative came from you. You found out what the systems were and you overcome the challenges one by one. So, so well done. There's a lot of uh, food for thought there. And maybe turning to, to John Fitzgibbons now, who is the Director of Further Education with Cork UTB. John, in terms of the, the challenges that are facing uh, various learners, not just the mainstream learners, we'll call them, but uh, how, how do you see the, 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 you know, how can the ETB, in terms of a pathway for every learner, how can the ETB uh, address all the needs and uh, I suppose in, in education we spend a lot of time developing our programs, making sure they're up to standard, recognised professional bodies and so on. But the next step is to get learners into them, particularly learners who, who, who face difficulties. So John, you will have all the answers for us there. Thanks John. Thanks Barry. I hope I have so many answers in that but I, I think it's very obvious listening to, to my other panel members in that that the causes of, of disadvantage and exclusion and that are many and varied and, and actually the impact for, for, for people isn't always visible in that to the person looking. And, and, and therefore the solution is complex and, that, and it needs all of us working on that solution. From a further education and training point of view from Cork ETB and that I think it starts with our community education services. Um, it starts at that point where our services engage with the individual and that, and that the programs are happening in communities designed with the individuals in communities, in groups to meet their needs. Because if we're not designing them that way, then we're not meeting the needs of the people, whether they're young or old. And that, you know, because, the, you know, it's not just something that affects a particular age group or a particular cohort. It goes right across society. And if we're going to be serious about addressing disadvantage and that further education and training with our other education and uh, partners in Cork, we, we have a unique um, environment here in Cork where there's a great relationship between the Education and Training Board, UCC and CIT to build those pathways. But the pathways have to start at the point where the learner can access them, where there is no barrier to getting onto that pathway. And I think that's what Cork Education and Training Board are doing with our programs. And some of our participants have made reference to, you know, community education, to accessing courses in Cork College of Commerce or, or, or further education colleges, and then going on to UCC and going on to CIT. Those pathways and that are critical if we're going to address disadvantage. And I think, um, you know, as we, as we look at the outcomes from this, this conference, this webinar, and we look to the future and that, we're setting a foundation and that um, based on the work that has happened here in Cork and that to establish a, a learning city, to build those pathways and make them even more accessible to, to people. Um, and I have to just reference in that the work that Solace have done in the strategy, the ambitious strategy they've set out for the further education and training sector for the next four years, and that where inclusion and pathways are two of the key pillars, and the third pillar being um, upgrading or developing skills. I think James made reference to, you know, um, the skills necessary to enter the world of work. And whereas work may not be the only um, outcome for somebody, but giving somebody the opportunity to avail and to engage with a job and had the dignity of, of work and the dignity of, of self-reliance in that, that's ultimately one of the parts of what the education pathway can give and deliver for learners. And Solis are very clearly committed to that. And 
just recently Annette announced an eight million euro fund, which I must say that Cork and had gathered nearly a million of, to mitigate against disadvantage for learners to access education. And that, but it's not simple, it's not easy. There are many, many facets in this. And as education partners, as an education and training board, as the higher ed institutions and the other partners in that, the one thing we have to always keep at the forefront of our thinking and our approach is the learner themselves. And it's not something we do for the learner. It's not something we do to the learner. It's something we have to do with the learner. Programs have to be designed and delivered in a manner which is accessible and which is appropriate to the learner. Because it's not easy for everybody to be able to go to a college or to go to a centre from nine o'clock until 12 o'clock or from nine o'clock until five. And that life gets in the way. And that, so we need to be flexible. And that's what our community education programmes and our approach is designed to do, to provide those programmes in those locations to make them accessible for people. And I think the other thing that you know, we're showing in Cork Education and Training Board, and I think Cork is showing through its Learning Cities programme and approach, is being ambitious. And that there are a lot of barriers. There are a lot of things that you know, we could say it's impossible to do this. But actually, if we're ambitious, and, uh, and we foster ambition in those people who come to us and go out and invite them in, and that uh, we can make sure that those pathways are there for everybody. And they're pathways, they're plural. There isn't just one singular journey. And when you listen to the stories, and, uh, and you listen to what people have said, and uh, you know, it, as part of this webinar, we realize that people have come through different routes, and those different routes can take them to different endpoints. It's a big challenge. It's a challenge, I think, that every one of us and that have to grasp. But I think this is, is setting the scene for a lot of the work that we will do over the coming years with the new network and that, that will emerge from this. And that, so, um, you know, further education and our partners in higher education and that, we all have a role to play and that, and there's a lot more still to be done. Thanks, Barry. Thanks, John. Could I just maybe ask you a question in terms of, say, the, the new department uh, for the higher education research and skills, and then going back again to the industry connection, I mean, the European standards and guidelines for quality in higher education, further education, certainly on the higher education side, they have an ambition that every student gets a placement. And again, it goes back to the whole idea of role models. Uh, do you see how, how could we strengthen our connections with industry, or how should the new department, which has skills, has research, further in higher ed. What advice would you give to Minister Harris in terms of um, driving on that, the connection with industry? Well, Barry, I don't think it would be for me to, to give advice to Minister Harris, but if he was listening, and, that, um, and he is listening, and, and I think we know that, and the, the new department, I think, is, is a very important part of addressing the, 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 the issues and the needs, as you pointed out. Um, I think the one thing that I would emphasize is that we need to have employers as part of the process from the very outset. Um, they can't be um, passive recipients of the graduates that come through our courses and that, and expect that you know, they will come into the workplace with the skills and that, that they as employers need. They need to be part of that journey and part of that process um, for those learners, providing the work placements, but also helping us in further ed and higher education which they are doing to, to, to a certain extent in terms of designing the courses and that so that they meet the needs of their industries, but also address and that the needs of the learners coming into them. And also while they're doing that, and that, that they make sure and that, that they provide the opportunities for those learners to participate in the workplace while they're going through their course. It's challenging for employers, but you know what? If they're going to um, end up with employees who are capable of not just sustaining their business, but allow it to develop, they have to be part of that pathway. Right. Thanks, John. Maybe just go back online there to, to, to James and bring, finish up maybe some of the learners. What, what, what changes would you like to see in the system that would encourage more learners back in to education? Because I think it's not just back in, you can go into education, come out of education, go back in again. You know, it, it shouldn't be just a, a one shot through from beginning to end. What, what changes would you, would you recommend, James, even in, in the philosophy rather than anything else, you know? Well, I just think um, 
as, as people get older, they, they, they gain more responsibilities, as I was saying earlier, in terms of mortgages, rent, bills, and children. Um, and a lot of the funding schemes seem to be, especially in higher education, seem to be geared towards um, full-time education. And that excludes a whole lot of adult learners that maybe want to upskill or learn something new or, um, or what have you. So I think that that's an area that, that needs to be addressed also. Um, the institute or the internal um, functions of, uh, let's say, a fees office, let's say an, an institution like um, UCC where you have 20,000 people um, and does the fees office have to deal with uh, collecting money. Um, not everybody has the means to pay up, let's say, and if you're waiting on Susie and there's complications and you're getting emails across your desk um, saying you're going to be cut from the library, you're going to cancel your card and final deadlines, um, that's a very uh, tough place to be, especially if you're from a non-traditional background, as we've spoken about, maybe with um, already had a negative experience of education or um, it's already a challenge for you to be a part of the education system. The last thing you need is pressure being put on you for fees, especially um, when you're doing all you can. So um, I, I know like there is access officers that do support with all that, um, but I know like that it is an issue. And I suppose if half from the financial, then there is the cultural and social aspect of it all. You know? And that's where um, the face is the first thing that I was talking about. You know, our team in a good series there with um, My Uni Life had been running for the last few weeks. And that was fantastic to show the positive experience that people have had from non-traditional backgrounds. And I think more of that will go a long way um, to, um, I suppose, recruiting um, non-traditional learners into foreign higher education. Thanks, James. And maybe to come back to Leanne there in terms of the, the whole issue of work placement again, and how important that is for people uh, to understand what the pathways are likely and maybe just to give a small few words on that to finish up please yeah i completely agree with what has already been said and i'd really emphasize that i would love to see um industry and employers be more involved um within the educational um stream i i suppose and i do think from the outset um, if more placements and internships were a part of the course and they went hand in hand, I think it would definitely encourage a lot more people from a lot of different backgrounds to come forward and engage in education. So I would be all for that. Okay, thanks, Leanne. Maybe, John, in terms of that connection with industry and business, where, where are we in terms of the ETB, Cork Chamber, Cork Business Association and so on? Strong links? I think there's strong links there. I think the Regional Skills Forum has been a, a very important part of, of building those links with industry in that. Um, and it is something that you know has developed, it's grown, but I think there's still more space for us to, to do more work in there to address some of the things that, that, that we need to see happening for learners. Okay, thanks John, Leanne, Martin, James, Boosie, and my colleague Roshi from CIT. So, Thank you very much. And now I'd like to welcome uh, our Lord Mayor, Lord Mayor of Cork, Councillor Joe Kavanagh, to address us. Arvera. As Lord Mayor and first citizen of Cork, a UNESCO learning city, I am happy to join all of you in support of today's event. And I want to affirm the commitment of the city that in terms of lifelong learning and education in all forms, Cork wants to make sure that no one is left behind. In 2015, Cork City Council signed a memorandum of understanding with our partners to implement UNESCO Learning City policies, building on centuries of cooperation and a shared mission. And following the third UNESCO International Conference on Learning Cities in 2017, the Cork Call to Action was formally adopted by Cork City Council. This challenges us to strengthen our commitment as a learning city to be more equitable and inclusive, green and healthy, and to support decent work and entrepreneurship. All our citizens are valued and their ambition to progress is a driver of the ambition and progress of our city and our society and it is in everybody's interest to create 
the conditions that support this. I want to again affirm our support in Cork City Council for today's discussions and for the Access for All Forum that will follow. We believe it will provide the platform for us as partners to take action and go forward together, leaving no one behind. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, Councillor Kavanagh, for your, for your inspirational words. Thank you. And maybe turning to Dennis now, uh, Dennis, what, what takeaways have we got from this morning's session so far? Well, I think there's been a lot of takeaways and a lot of food for thought, Barry. Mm. Um, if, you, if, you take the, if you take the first session that we both participated in, I suppose we were setting the context, uh, both, in, both the national context for further and higher education, for in terms of the in inclusion piece, the, the equality piece, working on looking at the sustainable development goal uh, in terms of education for all, the pathway for every, every learner, and the framework, I suppose, and the institutional framework that's there, that's set up to, to, to support that along with the, 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 the City Council, the, the, the employers, and how we all interact with each other. And I suppose there was a Cork, very strong Cork dimension to that in terms of the Learning Cities piece and how we've, how we've built a foundation on that and how we've worked through that through COVID and what we need to do and the challenges for the future. Uh, I think the international perspective was really interesting to see the international dimensions and what we learn, what we're learning from that in terms of, you know, the engagement between of uh, adult learners the, uh, from the OECD, the UNESCO experience, and then the national experience we into us in terms of the the, lear the learners and the engagement of learners and the supports that are needed and, and required. And I really think then the, the the cream in the top was the last piece. I think in terms of the individual perspectives of the journeys. Uh, that different that different people reflected in terms of their journeys of education and their continuing journeys of education, and what struck me of that one in particular was the people just overcoming the the, the barriers uh, in, that they that they had to that they had to face, and in some ways it depended on who they engage with or who they, who they met, and maybe the challenge for us as institution institutions is to ensure that there's a consistent approach. To that, to everyone that's that, that's in those uh, particular situations. So, just I, what I look forward and what I take away from this is that in Cork E2B, we're going to be developing our new uh, strategic plan for uh, from 2022 onwards, and we're going to be working on it during the course of next year. So, I'm really looking forward to just taking a lot of that with colleagues and building that into what we need to do for the next next number of, next number of years. And of course, Barry, under your own chairpersonship, I'm looking forward to the. The group that we bring together in terms of different stakeholders to build on to build on this on this work and indeed to work with some of the international institutions as well as national organizations in terms of what we need to do to build that consistency and to build upon the foundations that we've already set up yeah for sure and even today's webinar and going forward into the new year then there's quite a lot of people that have a hand in putting this together huge hand in putting it together and i suppose if i could start with thanking the department of further and higher education also, Solace in, in, in particular to uh, thank Andrew Brownie, who we heard from earlier this morning, but also to thank Nessa White, who has been instrumental in ensuring that we had the funding to support this through the Mitigating Against Education Disadvantage. Could I also uh, thank VE Studios here in, in Cork for like the great the great work that you, that they've they've done in facilitating this over the, over the over the morning and allowing us to have a different experience. Uh, in terms of uh, putting this webinar together. And then there was a, there was a group, uh, I suppose, that weren't in front of the camera, but were doing a huge amount of work behind the camera in relation to putting all this together over the last, last number of weeks. Uh, there was uh, Deirdre Creedon from CIT, Head of uh, Access, Dennis Barrett uh, from Cork, Cork City Council and also ETB, and then a whole range of my colleagues in, in, the, in the ETB, uh, Mike Lyons, Gillian Beasley, James Leonard, Kieran Lynch, and Ruth Griffin. And that group came together, they worked on this over the last number of weeks, they worked through all the various uh, aspects that needed to be ex explored. And I think what you've seen and what we have seen is that different international, national, and local perspective all, inter all interwound in this, in this webinar in terms of uh, access for all. So I really want to say a big thanks to them. And can I finally thank you, Barry, uh, for your moderation here this morning, of course, but of course this as well is one of your last gigs as president of, of, of CIT. So I think uh, we absolutely have to, have to say that your commitment to the whole equality, inclusion, diversity piece, and I think it was very much ex explored that in the, in the last panel there, it's very clear to see. And I just want to thank you for that and your commitment to it. And we really look forward to your continued commitment to it in your new role as chairperson of this new committee. So thanks very much. Right. Thank you, Dennis. And maybe for, for me, look, listening to this morning, I mean, I think we're looking at different pathways. 
there are other pieces out there like the recognition of prior learning, the recognition of prior experiential learning, there's professional apprenticeships, there's a new department, a specific government department looking at further higher education, research and skills. I think we just need to put the pieces together, get it going, you know, uh, because again, we're, and I think as COVID has shown as well, not one size fits all. I mean, if you take it, you know, in, in, in education terms, the student experience was seen as something nice to have out there on the side. But now that the students are all online, we all of a sudden find out the student experience is essential for professional networking, for building friendships, for social development and so on. So I think similarly here, I think it's, it's time to break the mold and look at the other pathways that are there. And in fact, maybe one of the days quite soon, the mainstream pathway might be one of the other pathways. You know, and learning while you're working, to, to answer James, James' point this morning, learning while you're working, recognising that learning. I mean, even yesterday we were in court prison presenting parchments, uh, online at least, to, to, to the inmates up there who actually, you know, got themselves qualified in, 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 in uh, cooking skills yesterday. So it, there, there's, there's a pathway for everyone. What I do think myself is that variety of pathways should be the mainstream, not the other way around, because we need to adapt. So thanks again, Dennis, for, for, the, for the great webinar today and to everyone who worked with me. Yeah, thank you.